Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivis. I am the Carb Addiction Doc and I've come up with a curious question that I think is so important and yet it's one that we don't really ask that often. Or we ask it but we don't know the answer. I was doing a podcast with um, a really cool guy, a guy by the name of Bronson Dant, D-A-N-T. Uh, YouTube him, Google him, uh, look at his Instagram. Uh, he's a physiologic uh, coach about my age but very heavily vested in keto, brilliant man. And you don't have to be a doctor to be knowledgeable and brilliant about the science of, of the ketogenic diet. And during my interview with him, the podcast I think is going to drop this week or next week. We'll have it on our channel. Um, we were talking about sports physiology and sports science and diet and optimizing diet. And we were talking about GLP-1 agonists and a variety of different things. And this man is brilliant. He made me think. And I love that when people make me think. And I had to pause and consider his question very carefully. And wow, yeah, that's an interesting question. How would I answer that? Anyway, long story short, one of the questions that popped into my head is this. When is the optimal time to train? When is the optimal time to go for a run, to lift weights, to go for the walk? When is the optimum time to do fairly intense physical activity? Hmm. Now, let me stop right there. So, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to pause and let you answer that question. When is the optimal time, and it's an open-ended question, when is the optimal time to exercise? And what criteria are important? Well, I'm going to now, for the purpose of this, exclude certain practical things. I'm going to exclude time of day that I can only exercise in the morning, or I can only exercise in the evening, or I can only exercise when the gym is open. Uh, those are lifestyle things. That's not what we're talking about. When is the optimal time for your body to train? I'm also going to take something else out. It's less good to train when you're exhausted. It's okay, but it's less good to train when you're exhausted. So physiologically, when is the best time to train? Well, let's look at this. What are you doing when you're training? When you're exercising, whether you're lifting weights or running, your muscles are being primarily used. The central governor theory that Tim Noakes talks about a lot is that the brain regulates optimal physical activity, not the muscles. The old thought was that energy supply, um, glucose and fat supply and lactate supply to the muscles for energy was the rate limiting step. And when your muscles ran out of energy, they stopped working. But that's BS, because if that was true, your muscles would go into rigor, rigor mortis, uh, the, the, the tightening of muscles in death. That's what would happen if they ran out of energy. They wouldn't be able to function. And we stop physical activity always before that happens. And really, when we stop physical activity is when our brain reduces our physical activity because it's trying to protect enough energy to the brain. So the brain is very selfish. It'll always look after itself. And Tim Noakes does a brilliant talk on this. I'm interviewing him again in November as part of a new textbook that we're releasing, the first Therapeutic Carbohydrate Restriction Textbook, a brilliant book, 62 authors. I was fortunate to be invited to write three of the science chapters. We'll talk more about that, but it's being released in March of next year. The first medical textbook about the science of a ketogenic diet. Be that as it may, um, when you are exercising, first and foremost, your brain needs adequate fuel. And the two fuels that your brain needs, it can live off very well, Glucose and fat, non-esterified fatty acids, short-chain fatty acids, and ketones. So those are the two optimal fuels for the human brain. And if the brain has adequate fuel uh, uh, store going to it, because the brain doesn't store fuel coming at it, then your muscles can, op can, can function optimally. When the brain senses it's starting to run out of fuel, the first thing it begins to do is shut down all other superfluous functions. And the biggest waster of energy, the biggest resource of shutdownable energy utilization are your muscles. So if the brain senses it's starting to run out of fuel, out of energy, it shuts down your muscles. Just like when we guys are driving a car and it starts to redline on the fuel tank, first thing we do is we open the windows, we shut down the air conditioning, we shut off all the other itinerant sources of energy because we want to drive that car as far as we can before we fill up. We don't want to run out of fuel. Same thing with the brain. It shuts down unnecessary things and the biggest one it shuts down is exercise. Not going to shut the heart down, it may slow the heart down a little bit, but that's part of not exercising. 
Okay, and remember the brain can either use glucose or ketones. If the brain is glucose dominant, then one energy de decrease, a slight drop in sugar supply to the brain will shut it down. So you are less likely to perform well. It's not a good place to exercise when you are glucose dominant. So your exercise performance is less good because of brain function, not because of muscle function. Fitness equivalent, your ability to be, to perform, your performance is lower when you are glucose dominant, insulin resistant, and you cannot produce or supply fat to the brain. If you are fat adapted and in ketosis, most of that energy will be sugar, but some of it will be fat, and the brain doesn't care which one. It'll use ketones as well as glucose, and you can perform for a much longer period of time because those ketones are available. So that's not the answer, though, but brain supply, being in ketosis, being fat adapted, allows you to perform better. But when's the best time to exercise? And we said that it is the supply of energy to the human body. So the way the human body works every day is in two phases in over about 12 hours. So there are two separate phases that the healthy human body goes through, just like the tides. And remember, we are shoreline-based evolution and animals. So we grew up along shorelines. And along those lines, when did we have access to marine food as the tide went out and as the tide came in? Didn't have a lot of food at high tide, didn't have a lot at low tide. So anyway, that's a story for a different day. So we are tidal in terms of what happens in our bodies. And the two systems that the body fluctuates through is a brief or a short-lived two to four hour anabolic phase during and after meal times. So when we eat, and it doesn't matter what we eat, let's say we're going to eat a steak, let's say we're going to eat some ice cream, it doesn't matter. That food goes into the gut and it triggers from the gut hormones, GLP-1, uh, GIP, the gut hormones trigger certain hormones in the body that are anabolic. Insulin, thyroid hormone, human growth hormone, it triggers those as our anabolic hormones or as our storage hormones. So what those hormones do is they get triggered when we're eating or around meal times, and they take the food that we're eating, they modify the food, turn it into protein, turn it into fat, store it as glycogen or sugar in the muscles and in the liver. They're storing energy. They're putting energy away in storage. So they're creating fat, they're creating glycogen, they're creating protein, they're creating cholesterol. They're making energy. But the energy when you're anabolic, is for storage. So the worst time to exercise, the worst time to exercise in terms of energy availability is during the anabolic phase of your day. The worst time to exercise is shortly after a meal. The worst time to exercise is within the hour or two after a meal because you're anabolic and if your body's storing energy, that's, that energy is not available for use as much by your brain and by your muscles and by your heart and by the other organs that are functioning when you're exercising. So the worst time to exercise, the worst thing to do is to eat and then exercise especially carbohydrates, but any foods that trigger GLP-1 are going to trigger that anabolic response that is optimal for growth, for muscle growth, for, for growth and repair of your organs. Human growth hormone, thyroid hormone, those are your anabolic hormones. But when we're exercising, when we're running or when we're exercising, that to a certain extent represents a fright and flight, fright and flight mechanism. So what we need when we're exercising is the liberation of energy, of fat, and of glucose from the liver, from the fat cells, and from within the muscles. Well, insulin blocks that. Glucagon, glucagon facilitates the release of fat, blocks the conversion of sugar to fat, and facilitates lipolysis, the breakdown of fat, the release of fat into the bloodstream, attached to albumin as non esterified fatty acids. Glucagon converts protein into sugar and releases into the bloodstream. Glucagon releases sugar from the liver for the brain and for the, for the muscles and for the heart. Glucagon converts fat into ketones that are readily available. Glucagon helps with lactate metabolism. Glucagon is 
your energy supply hormone. Even though it's called catabolic because it's breaking down those stores, we want to be in glucagon dominant states for a long period of time. Best for brain function because you're thinking when you've got all that glucose and fat, that slightly higher concentration, carefully controlled by something called the Randall cycle, which I've got a whole video on coming up uh, in the near future. I'm still working on that video. Very, very important topic, very controversial topic. But the Randall cycle really determines whether your cells are primarily using sugar or fat and they regulate each other. That's part of the glucagon cycle. Now, just as an aside, you can go and Google this. When Philip Randall in 1963 wrote his paper, we did not know much about glucagon. There's a little foretaste for people when we discuss the Randall cycle. But the Randall cycle is true. It's the use of every cell, particularly the muscle cells, the heart cells, and the fat cells, whether they're primarily using fat or sugar, and how those two interact. But that's under the influence of glucagon, which Randall did not know much about. It was discovered in 1959. He understood the concept, but hadn't done any experiments with it. We'll explore that. That's just the teaser for those of you who are bookworms to go and research. But the point is this. The optimum time to exercise is when you have the maximum source of energy available for your liver, uh, sorry, for your muscles, being released to your muscles and your brain and your heart, available fat and protein, and able to enter those cells. Under the influence of glucagon, uh, you are able to break down the glycogen that you've stored under the influence of insulin. So everybody thinks, a lot of people think that insulin is required to shove that sugar into the cells because muscles require a GLUT4 insulin receptor to get the sugar into the cells. BS, that's not correct. I mean, it is correct. But that is happening during and after a meal where you're replenishing glycogen as a store within the muscle cell. But if you've got high insulin levels, those muscles can't use fat. They can't use ketones. So it disrupts the Randall cycle. When your insulin level is low and glucagon is high, the muscles are able to mobilize the glycogen stored in the muscles. But more importantly, they're able to use ketones and fat as a primary fuel source. And they run optimally if you are fat adapted. So you notice how all of this wraps in. The ideal time to exercise is toward the end of intermittent fasting during the day when you are glucagon dominant. What other hormones are important? Cortisol. Cortisol is your fright and flight hormone. Cortisol is part of the anabolic experience. Cortisol is released in greater amounts when you're fasting. Cortisol allows that energy to be mobilized and available to your body. Primarily the brain. Brain doesn't need insulin to get sugar into it, to get ketones into it. Your muscles have an adequate supply of non-esterified fatty acids and ketones and sugar within them. And a little bit of sugar trickling in, even though insulin is at basal levels. So the optimum time biologically to exercise is before you eat, in that glucagon dominant fasted state. That is the optimal time to do your intense exercise. And if you exercise to the point of exhaustion, Ben Baccio, um, brilliant uh, exercise plan, shout out to you, Ben, uh, because he exercises to the point of muscle exhaustion, the HIIT training, whatever it may be. I love his program, especially if you're a little bit older. Protects your joints, works really well. But you're optimizing that fasting state to maximize energy, but go to the point of burnout where you've decreased your energy supply to the point that your muscles can no longer probably function, which gives you the optimal growth period for those muscles. We call it bonking, but that happens in people who are glucose dominant. However, the best time, the most optimal time, in my opinion, to exercise is during the latter part of a fast, whether it's an intermittent fast during the day, when you are glucagon, cortisol, somatomedin dominant, when your insulin, your human growth hormone, your thyroid hormone is at that low ebb. So that you're catabolic, not anabolic, substrate available for your muscles. Then when you've finished exercising, that's the time to have your meal. You switch off glucagon because you've exhausted that supply. You switch off cortisol because you're now recovering and you're feeding your body and insulin surges, GLP-1 surges, T3 surges, HGH, human growth hormone surges. Now you're building muscle. Now you're replenishing all that 
energy to the muscle stores as glycogen because you've depleted it. So all that glucose that's coming from protein or coming from carbohydrates gets stored in the, in the muscles. Your brain is relaxing. It's chilling out. Your brain can then restore itself. You switch on glucagon, you may switch off ketones a little bit. You've still got the non-esterified fatty acids floating around. That, to my mind, is the optimal way to train. Now, all you experts in, in exercise, all you experts in biology, let's go. Let's go toe-to-toe. To toe. Let's argue about this. But the fundamentals of the science of energy provision, if you're fat adapted and in ketosis, is to train under a glucon, in a glucagon-dominant hormonal milieu and then to replenish with an insulin-dominant one. Now, the problem with exercising in insulin resistance is that insulin overflows as a hormone into the fasting state. So if insulin is flatlined, now, even though you're fasting, even though you've done a prolonged fast, your fasting insulin is elevated. That's called insulin resistance. And the problem then is you don't have fat available to you. All you got is sugar. And because you're insulin resistant, you can't get the insulin to the sugars. Guess what you are? It's fatigued and flat and you can't perform properly. So as part of this is to restore the cycle between insulin dominance and glucagon dominance, that anabolic catabolic cycle. But that's the best time, in my opinion, to exercise. Argue with me, support me, leave comments. Let's go at this. Let's explore it. I am opening myself up. I'm opening up my vision of the science. Let's work this out. Not I'm right, you're wrong. But let's figure this out together. That's why this channel exists, folks, is to make you think, to think about the science, to think about the biology, and maybe change your own behavior pattern to optimize your health. And by the way, the last comment I'm going to make, the single most important item associated with healthy longevity is physical activity. Physical activity. And physical activity has four components. Strength, endurance, flexibility, and balance. And the healthiest person incorporates all four as variable dominant aspects of their everyday. A little bit of yoga, a little bit of stretching, a little bit of of endurance work, a little bit of, of strength work, and a lot of balance work. And if that's what you're doing, you're optimizing your anabolic catabolic cycle, you're going to have to get run over by a bus where the driver was texting and you were running on the side of the road because you're not going to kill yourself through illness. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. Hit me up with comments. If you love what are we saying, hit the subscribe button so you get more of these content of uh, this content proposed to you. But also, if you like what we're talking about, if you want to support us, throw a dollar or two at our Patreon account, Carb Addiction Doc, or drop a penny or two to our uh, PayPal account that's listed down below. It is a nonprofit. It's a charitable organization. We spend this money on education. I don't get any of it myself. I am the Carb Addiction Doc, 561-517-0642 to set up a visit, to set up a consult with a medical doctor. I'm not a sports science guy, but I know a fair amount about the biology behind it. 